We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello everybody, uh, welcome to this town hall session at the Internet Governance Forum 2021. My name is Kate Russell and I am very pleased to be chairing this discussion hosted by Kaspersky and tackling the very complex issues surrounding the use and risks around human augmentation. Now that term might make you think about cyborgs or even Steve Austin, the bionic man, but in truth it's an area of innovation that's been part of the human story for decades now. Whether it's prosthetic limbs, hearing aids or pacemakers, there are already many ways that we turn to technology to fix our bodies. And as we look to the future, it's not inconceivable that technological enhancements might be developed to help us become more than human, to see further, move faster, lift heavier weights or even learn more effectively. It might sound like the stuff of science fiction, but having reported on technology since 1995, when less than 1% of the planet was online and home computers were still kind of a novelty, I can confirm that the only constant is rapid change. And with every new tech innovation the world invents comes a new realm of risk that needs to be mitigated. So this is the purpose of our discussion today, to have a multi-stakeholder talk about how cybersecurity threats for human augmentation device, devices, both existing and whatever might come in the future, uh, what are they? Uh, and share some of the ideas about how these threats might be addressed on an international level. We are taking questions from the floor, both online and from those attending live in Poland. Hello to you, by the way, if you're actually in Poland. My colleague Arno is there with you, uh, ready to pass on your questions. Arno, give them all a wave so they know who you are. Uh, so you can go and flag him down and you can also take part in the discussion. Um, so let's meet our stakeholders. Joining us today, we have Marcelo de Arujo, who is Professor of Philosophy of Law at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Wojtek Paprota, founder and CEO of Wallet More, which is a UK company making subdermal implants. Ilya Czech, who is CEO at Motorica, who, who make prosthetic limbs and they're based in Russia. Uh, Jorge Crevado, uh, co-founder of Robotic, Robotic, Robotics Lab, makes all kinds of robotics and they're based in Chile. Uh, Tristan Vuga is co-founder of TWICE, uh, a company that makes medical exoskeletons, and they're based in Switzerland. And Marco Preuss, who is director of Kaspersky's global research and analysis team, uh, and he is based in Europe. Uh, also joining us a little later on will be Eva Kali, who is a member of the European Parliament for Greece and also chairman of the European Parliament Committee on the Future of Technology and Science. Uh, so a well-heeled panelist, uh, to talk about this topic and I'd like to start by asking each of you for your opening statements to share your thoughts on the main challenges of human augmentation as a phenomenon and how you see the world mitigating the risks and let's just go with the order in which I introduced you so Marcelo uh, the floor is yours. Don't forget to unmute yourselves everybody. <laughs> To beg a pun. Uh, thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Uh, there are so many different kinds of technology for the purpose of um, human augmentation. And people can have very strong opinions about this. And right now, during the pandemic, we see how people react to, to this because vaccines to work as a kind of human augmentation, it's a kind of human enhancement that makes our immune system better adapted to. to, to address a new kind of environment. Um, but then we see too how people react to this kind of modification of their bodies through vaccines. And I think the only way to, to address this problem is having this kind of conversation we're going to have here with our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. So hopefully uh, we will begin to bash out some of those ideas as we go along. Um, Wojtek, over to you. So implants, smart implants are of course a great 
example of body augmentation because in theory or also in practice uh, they act as six sense to our bodies we can directly interact with certain machines and technologies uh, thanks to the implants and in case of Walkmore and the payment implants that we make it's of course the payment terminals and uh, the reason why we decided to pursue that way is that smart implants when it comes to payments uh, break this reverse in your relationship between safety and or security and convenience because up until this point the users had to choose between convenience whatever they wanted to have a super convenient way of authorizing uh, activities such as payments uh, well, so the most convenient way would be to have biometrics whatever it's a finger uh, fingerprint scanning or eye scanning or even face id scanning uh, but let's imagine that once that part of uh, your identity is getting stolen, scanned by the third party, it's not possible to change it. You, you cannot change your face in a significant manner so that it becomes a different one. Uh, so that is very insecure. On the other hand, we have devices which are super secure, such as tokens, whatever it's a smartphone, a smartwatch, even a standard payment card, uh, which can be blocked uh, whenever there, there's uh, a, a problem that you, you are facing as a customer, as a user and get the new one. And you will not get a new face, you will not get a new finger. Uh, of course, you have 10 of them, so one day you will definitely, you will definitely run out of them. Uh, but implants are that kind of a device that are already embedded into your body, uh, which is super, super convenient, just like biometrics. And they are super uh, secure because whenever there is a problem with a particular token, with a particular application, for example, the payments, you can, decode it and change it and reprogram it uh, just like you do with a standard bank card or a standard device. And I, I believe that that's the biggest advantage of the smart implants, not, also, not only in the payment industry, but in general in the, uh, in the digital identity industry. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. And definitely interested to hear more about that as we go along as well. Ilya, over to you. Uh, yeah, hi to all. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think about uh, one interesting uh, example of uh, augmentation. I like to uh, when when I spoke with someone or in conference about uh, human augmentation, about our work, our prosthesis devices. Uh, I often uh, say about uh, plastic surgery. Uh, after Second World War, it was just medical procedure. Yeah, without any any, any ideas about um, make make, the, make uh, your body uh, simple better than uh, it was. Uh, but in 10, 20, 30 years, uh, plastic surgery became just uh, simple uh, surgeon, uh, simple medical and not medical uh, case. Uh, when you want, you can just uh, change your nose, change your ears, any kind of uh, your body. And uh, this is a uh, great example how um, augmentation uh, transfer from the medical usage, for example, in uh, firstly in prosthesis or in exoskeletons for disabled people. And then this technology will transfer in uh, just healthy people to enhance some kind of uh, functionality. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great uh, example of uh, future prediction how, how the human augmentation will um, will be um, will will use in future. Yeah. Uh, for now, we use, for example, prosthesis only for uh, handicapped people. But in future, uh, when it uh, will become the simple surgery, simple operation, uh, we will see that the uh, humans will just change their own hands uh, for uh, multifunctional prosthesis uh, with, uh, with inbuilt payment card, pay, payments cards, yes, with inbuilt uh, smartphone functionality and all this gadget inside uh, this prosthesis or any uh, another implants. Uh, so it's what my, my, my first word <laughs> about this. Yeah, it's, one, it's an interesting topic and we already have seen over the last couple of Paralympics, I think, you know, the evidence of prosthetics actually can be an enhanced human performance um, in, in the right hands. Um, we'll hear more about that later on. Um, Jorge, over to you. 
Hi. Uh, at Robotics Lab SEL, we, we have already been working at Over My Next. It is a wheelchair that it's controlled by brain computer interfaces. Okay, so uh, I think that it is a great example of human augmentation. And human augmentation is quickly growing on our society. So we need to act fast in order to make things the right way. Uh, we can stop in this new type of technologies to appear, but we have to be careful and work together so that, so that nothing goes out of control. And that's it, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely, very succinct. And um, we're going to talk a lot about the security, uh, additional security yeah. risks um, around that. Uh, before we do that, let's speak to Tristan. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, well, at twice we believe that the um, essence of life as a human is to use all our senses to, you know, explore and experience the world around us but that this particular mission is made much more difficult for about 65 million people that live in a wheelchair every day. Um, and our mission as a company is to help people reconnect with their community and reconnect with, with their vocation by giving them back access to life. And as a company, we engineer human machine interaction and our, our first product is a powered exoskeleton that lets people stand up and walk again. We believe that human augmentation is everywhere from the chair you might be sitting on right now to the glasses that some of us are, are wearing. Uh, but we are also convinced that technology can only be ethical if it's meant to reduce inequalities as opposed to increase inequalities between, between humans. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we are going to get on to the question of the potential digital divide, uh, you know, as we, we, we know it uh, as it exists at the moment um, in a little while. Um, but now let's hear from Marco Preuss. Again, let's be honest. With human augmentation, we're not just talking about some technology, some hype, something, yeah, some niche or whatever. We're talking about one important aspect of future mankind. It is already around us, and we will see more and more developments. So we have different problems and challenges here to solve right now, like today, better yesterday, to be honest. Uh, on one side, we have the technological challenges. On the other side, uh, the challenges in terms of the society. So we need to have more agreements, not only standardizations, but really exchange on things. We need to have policies and regulations, but not in terms to limiting things down, but more to shape this new world, this technology, which will be an essential integrated part of the future humanity. Absolutely, very good point um, all of you have raised. And as I say, we'll hear from Eva Kali, uh, the Member of Parliament for Greece, a Member of the European Parliament for Greece uh, in a little while. She's actually in another session at the moment. She's gonna dash straight over to us. Um, but one of the really big important things that we want to get um, out of today's session is really to come up with um, some ideas, um, you know, put some thoughts down on paper about how we can protect and regulate and also encourage innovation without um, you know, allowing, as we have so many other technological innovations over the decades, we've kind of let them go a bit wild and on their own at first. And then we go, oh goodness, where are we now? How do we control this? So um, this is what I really want to drill into today with all of you. Uh, human augmentation, the field that focuses on creating cognitive and physical improvement as an integral part of the human body is one of the most significant technological trends today. We're already seeing a wide range of practical applications, as we've discussed a little bit already, being deployed across the everyday areas of our lives like health, social care, sport, education and transport. Exoskeletons for fire and rescue um, operators or bioprinting of organs are just a couple of examples. People are generally happy to see this technology used for the good of humanity, because uh, Bersky's done some research on that. Um, but there are also very real concerns about how this kind of innovation might be used in the hands of bad actors and what risks we open our bodies up to when it comes to cybersecurity. Because as we all knew, know, every new uh, innovation comes with a whole new herd of um, cyber 
criminals who want to take advantage of it. So um, I would like to start with a question to Wojtek. Um, your company sells a computer chip that users have implanted under their skins so that they can pay for stuff, I'm guessing, just by waving their hand over the terminal. Also, as you said, the security um, implications of having it as something that isn't sort of, you know, part of your body so it can be changed. The lines between our physical and digital identities are merging all the time in this connected world. So how do we ensure that human augmentation is used safely? And how can we make sure that digital technologies are not developed and used for harmful purposes? Wojciech. Okay, so let's start with the most important aspect that it cannot be forced to anyone. Having an implant or having another uh, type of body augmentation needs to be voluntary for anyone. And of course, when it comes to this type of, that's the fundamental. When it comes to the further aspects that we have already raised, I believe that uh, firstly, we need to understand what the technology that we are using for a certain company that uh, offers this solution to us is using. So when it comes to uh, wallet more technology, uh, it's, NFC, which stands for Near Field Communication. So the first thing that probably comes to your mind when talking about implants and when talking about potential threats and issues with cybersecurity, in our case, is the possibility of being spied or uh, tracked or monitored in such a way. So uh, it takes just a couple of minutes to learn that the NFC technology works only in a near field, as the name says. So uh, whenever we are talking about potential threats of spying or monitoring someone someone's location, uh, you will learn that I am in a certain place only when you are a few centimeters away from me. So that's the very important fundamental we're talking in general about uh, potential misuse of, of our technology. Uh, when it comes to the other concerns that we have raised uh, related to cybersecurity, uh, of course, in terms of wallet more, it's a very niche product and a very much an MVP kind of product. So for now, we are using the well-established technologies together with our major partner, uh, the major uh, payment scheme company, um, and the cybersecurity uh, solutions, such as uh, 3D secure system or such as any other encryption kind of methods, uh, encryption methods for transactions are at the very top level. Why? Because we are working with the best people, the best people and the best companies in the market. Uh, when it comes to evolving and when it comes to developing this uh, technology even better to ultimately merge our physical and digital identity, we need to make sure that the identity is protected in multiple uh, stages and in multiple factors. What we certainly shouldn't do is put all the valuable information on the implant. The implant can only act as a gateway from a certain terminal, from a certain phone or any other device to a super secure, multi-protected system, like an ecosystem, uh, so that the information can be only accessed through the implant or uh, read through an implant and not edited or uh, even or hacked. So that's what we are actually working on to establish this multiple, not even two-step, but three-step authorization to make sure that the data that is stored uh, on a cloud-based system actually is super safe, unhackable, and uh, possible to be changed and edited only by an authorized user, not by any party that may be capable of uh, accessing the implant itself. So that's the bottom line in terms of making sure that the data is uh, secure. And whenever there is anyone at this panel who is willing to invest, work, or develop any implantable technology, uh, as a person who is very much a leader in this in this field, I definitely encourage you to do everything you can to make sure that the information is not on the implant, but in the ecosystem, because there is a lot of potential to make sure it's protected. And as long as the protection methods are already there, we need to take advantage of them and simply add this little, little upgrade, which is, which is the implant. Well, I'm glad you clarified that actually, because I do remember, I was going to ask, I remember being at DEF CON, which is a big hackers conference um, a few years back. Um, and I actually had my credit card um, was scanned, you know, because you're crushed into a lift, because there are lots of places, I mean, obviously not with COVID at the moment, I know everyone's spaced out, but there are lots of instances in life when we are kind of crushed together, 
Uh, and that would be my fear that, you know, how do we protect ourselves from people getting close enough to us you know, to actually um, get information, but the fact that you, you know, it becomes your your key for the lock rather than actually the the the, the safe and everything that's in it. Um, okay, let's move on. We'll we'll come back to, to more on that in a while. And don't forget, if you are watching either online or live, and you've got any uh, comments or questions that you would like to um, contribute, then do let us know. Uh, Marco. Um, I have worked with you for several uh, years now, chairing Kaspersky discussions about human augmentation, and it is very easy to get blown away with the possibilities. You saw Tristan's video and, you know, we've got somebody who's obviously physically disabled, able to walk up a mountain. It's easy to get very excited uh, when you meet the inspirational people that I've met during the discussions with you. But opportunities, with opportunities come risks and uncertainties. And as the technology becomes more mainstream, so will the cybersecurity issues. So what about the existing digital threats that can affect augmented devices today? Oh, mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, we have, um, it, it's a huge topic. Uh, let's bring it down a bit. To be honest, I think what Wojciech had just said before, uh, especially in payment systems, we have certain standardization, and that's good. And I think he took that into account. In many other fields, we have the problem um, that you have a focus on a certain field, which may not be IT security, and therefore you're probably lacking, or there is a potential of lacking uh, a certain necessary steps in terms of IT security, but also in terms of privacy. Just having a look at uh, the previous trends, I mean, this topic IoT, for example, before we had like mobiles and so on. And every time we've seen that this new technology appeared, dropped into the market, uh, was running completely wild and uncontrolled, and we got a lot of problems in any terms you can imagine. We had attacks, we had malware going on, we had ransom attacks, we had so many things. Uh, which had a huge impact, and they're still going on, to be honest. And the problem here, what I see is, if technologies gets closer and closer to the human body, we're talking about a way more sensitive area, and therefore we have to take way more steps to make it safe, to make it protected, and really take the learning steps, what we have done from the past decades, from so many different technologies, adapt them, develop them further to make this, uh, these uh, technologies uh, better. Because I see from the PUC attacks from certain uh, smaller devices, from certain implants, what we've seen already in the past, like pacemakers got hacked, insulin pumps got hacked, and so on. So these are known, these are documented. But they were, of course, kind of a small area because there were just a smaller group of people who really had them. But just imagine this on a global scale or just on a country scale or just on a city scale. It doesn't have to be that big, but as long as you have enough devices which are either vulnerable or can be attacked or somehow criminals can do something with it, then you have a problem and we should do all our best to not make this a reality. What are some of the good practices that you can advise uh, people to address the problems and make sure that they, you know, address them actually ahead of production and ahead of products becoming mainstream? Because this is the time to do it, right? Exactly that and exactly what you mentioned. This is exactly the first step, not thinking about security when the product is already done or, and ready to ship, but before in the development process as early as possible, taking into consideration what problems may appear and also what we can do against it. A very simple example, what we're still lacking in many uh, um, devices and aspects of IoT area is a simple update functionality, for example. So you have all this amazing functionality, these standards, these technologies, these exchange and whatsoever, you ship the product, but if something happens, you have no chance to adjust it later on. So simple mistakes. Think about it first place when you're in the development. If you don't have the expertise, 
talk to the people with the expertise. There are many IT security experts out there, like me, for example, but also others. It's a huge community. It's a huge global community. You will find someone near you, talk to them, involve them, and ensure that these technologies get uh, secured. I know a lot of penetration testers as well, pen testers in shorthand. Um, and if you're not familiar with that term, they are ethical hackers who uh, you can ask to try and hack into your system so that you, they can find the holes for you. Uh, that's always a good a good move too. We're starting to get questions, but I'm gonna hold them because we have 10 minutes of questions a little bit later on. But Marta, don't worry, we'll get to your question. Um, Ilya. Uh, your business makes prosthetic limbs for amputees currently. Do you think that human augmentation and enhancement should be restricted to health and medical use? Um, or is there an argument for expanding it into recreational and even business use? Um, I think it's impossible to, to restrict new technologies. It's uh, like with uh, genomics. For now, okay, for now we restrict some kind of CRIPS, CRIPS instruments, uh, but Come on, <laughs> it, it, it uh, will be uh, usage in, in different kinds of situations in future. And uh, it's impossible to restrict new technologies. I don't believe in this. And um, in fact, in, uh, in our uh, company, we receive about um, three, three, four hundred uh, new clients per month. And from these three uh, hundred clients, uh, I think uh, five or 10, uh, it's healthy people who call to us and ask whether I can uh, just uh, cut off my hand and uh, produce uh, the prosthetic devices uh, instead of my uh, healthy hand. Uh, we we uh, say to those people, not, not, not now, maybe in 15, 20 years, uh, okay, it will be um, enable uh, option, let's say that. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge ethical issue around that, though, isn't there? Because where, you know, where there are good players and there are always bad players as well, and, and you're a very, you know, upstanding company, but, um, you know, at some point they, they may find somebody who will just do it for them. Uh, the ethical issues around that are huge. Do you think we need to develop commonly agreed standards that, that, that transcend borders or, or, or do we just leave it up to industry to manage itself? Yeah, of course, it's a great ethical question because uh, um, just just simple example. Uh, I like examples. <laughs> uh, for example, we have uh, one case here uh, with uh, our client with prosthesis. Uh, uh, such case when uh, he uh, had a fight with some person, and uh, in this fight he uh, broke this his, his prosthetic arm. And uh, how we uh, should uh, uh, how we should uh, in uh, for example for, for police for future uh, for future case in, uh, uh, in low, low how, how low case uh, it's um, you broke someone uh, device or you broke someone hand yeah for for because for the handicapped people the prosthesis it's like your hand. It's, it's not a device, it's not a smartphone. Uh, yeah, it's your part of your body. And uh, such questions are really interesting uh, and uh, for, for society. And uh, we uh, has to, uh, I think, um, of course we uh, has to uh, admit the security issue uh, due, uh, before we uh, go to the market here yeah, in development process. But of, uh, also, we have to uh, admit uh, some ethical issues uh, during the development process because uh, for now, society, uh, I think, uh, aren't read, isn't ready for, for, for such technologies and for such questions because there is no cases uh, uh, how, how to, uh, how, how, to um, how to admit it's... Uh, body part or it's just a device uh, that use uh, usage for some uh, some person uh, and uh, i think it's really inter interesting question not for, not only for prosthesis for example for exoskeletons yes uh, uh, whether it's the part of the body uh, of the uh, person who use this exoskeleton or it's just uh, like a car for example yeah like a device uh, and uh, uh, i think we should 
uh, ask these questions in such uh, platforms, such such conference uh, and uh, discuss and make some rules, maybe some ethics, uh, new new laws, maybe uh, in uh, this uh, part of new future. Yes, yeah, it's a really interesting point, actually, I hadn't even thought about, you know, sort of the impact of somebody if you damage their prosthet prosthetic limb or whatever. Also, I would imagine getting hit with a prosthetic yeah. hand could potentially be a lot more damaging to whoever well, was being sure, hit course. by it yeah. as well. Um, okay, lots of interesting questions raised. Uh, Jorge, Robotics Labs is your business, uh, has been innovating in the fields of retail, health, education, and industrial. Um, from your wide range of experience, do you think that human augmentation and enhancements should be restricted to health and medical use or expanded? Okay, so since the beginning of humanity, humans have evolved, increasing his capacities physically, mentally, and cognitively. In different dimensions, the human being has expanded his capacity, capacities and has perfected himself, and, it's, and in this way has also made it possible to improve his environment. I think that the improvement and human development in, the medica, in talking about medical or health uh, uses should be a prior, priority not something exclusive, but for all areas of knowledge and human development due to the enormous diversity of stocks, currents, and needs, limiting the development of knowledge is very difficult. We run the risk of generating bias towards an innovation that is fundamental in the future, and the inter international organizations and governments can favor certain areas of knowledge or research that favor are helpful in solving a specific and cross-cutting cross problems uh, sorry, of humanity. Yes, yeah. I mean, you're right. In, in some respects, the, the wheel could be considered as a, a type of augmentation of the human condition anyway, at least. Um, do you think that we need to develop those some agreed standards, you know, international standards that, that everyone should be abiding by? Or do you think it should be just, you know, just let innovators innovate? Yeah, I think that first it is necessary to educate uh, authorities and legislators also in universities so that uh, future development uh, is considered to be human and nature as an axis of trans transversal care. Uh, as a basis for the both, uh, it is possible to think about regulation and standards or safe work protocols, uh, especially in aspects where people are affected by technology uh, without losing the human right in, mat in matters of freedom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but to fully enjoy what technology brings, human augmentation, augmentation uh, must be uh, adequately protected uh, against cyber, cyber threats uh, and under certain global principles. Uh, this in turn uh, will promote innovation and stimulate, uh, stimulate the industry, which will, uh, without a doubt, uh, benefit society. And I think that that is the challenge that, that we have. Yeah. Educate, don't legislate. Um, I, I hear you. I, that's a, a term that I agree with wholeheartedly. Uh, Tristan, same question to you, really. Um, you know, medical exoskeletons, you help people walk again. Um, do you think that it should be limited to medical use? Well, in fact, we really believe that augmentation is acceptable and even desirable in many cases. And that, you know, the primary concern is accessibility. Um, it's not a matter of uh, whether it's the field the field of use is, is leisure or not. It's a matter of whether what you're offering is reducing inequalities and therefore whether it's accessible. And that's why we have also innovated on the business model to make sure that our technology is as accessible as possible. So we have a, a pay per use service. So. Uh, our patients can book uh, our, our devices for just one session of an hour at the rate of $150 per hour, which is a lot more accessible than the $150,000 that they wouldn't have needed to pay uh, to buy a device like ours. And in general, I would say that as a company, we have a really strong ethical guideline in our developments, and we only develop applications that are certain, that are certain to reduce inequalities. And well, we can't prevent others from misusing technology. We can definitely uh, educate people around risks or misuses, and that goes along the same line as what Ilya was saying before. Um, I think it's not our role as technology makers or industry players to, to self-regulate. We've seen enough cases where self-regulation has failed 
I think our duty is really to raise awareness, to educate the general public about potential pitfalls of technology and uh, that, that we're developing. And it is up to the general public and the policymakers to understand the stakes at hand and create the legal frameworks that, um, that make people uh, understand uh, everything and for people to really benefit from, from our technology. And I would say that eventually it's a question of incentives, you know, it, if the company is structured with only profit in mind, then it becomes difficult to stick to these ethical guidelines. And that's why we as a company ambition to involve our users in the capital structure of the company so that the financial performance, which we of course aim for, we really ambition to have a financially stable and viable and performing company that this performance also benefits our users eventually. Absolutely. Well, time is disappearing. So let's crack on um, with the next element of the discussion. We've talked already about the topic of regulation and where the responsibility for oversight might lie. But I would like to broaden the discussion now to include stakeholder roles and responsibilities. What does the landscape for human augmentation look like in the future? And how do we ensure inclusion and accessibility so we're not kickstarting the next big digital divide. Uh, Marcelo, as our academic stakeholder in this discussion, what do you observe in the academic and research sectors? I think there has been a lot of ethical discussion about um, the ethics of uh, human enhancement. And one thing is clear, there is not a general theory to assess the ethics of human enhancement, because there are many different methods for enhancement um, pharmaceuticals, drugs, um, high-tech prosthetic limbs, um, wearable devices, genetic engineering. So this, there are different means of augmentation. But then too, there are so many different uh, targets for the augmentation. That is our cognitive capacities, our physical strength, and now uh, uh, our immune system, for example, too, is the object of augmentation through vaccination. So I don't think there is for every combination of method of enhancement and target, we see lots of different ethical questions. I think I think many of the questions uh, turn around the, the, the whole of the role of the state. Uh, should the state prohibit these technologies to regulate? But then too, we can also think of situations where the state might be expected to provide the, the technology if it's going to provide uh, autonomy and equality. This is exactly what's uh, happening now with the uh, vaccination. Even though, as I said at the beginning, uh, people um, can have very strong opinions about this technology. And, as I said, I don't think there is a general uh, theory, uh, ethical theory for the assessment of this topic. We have to have in mind which kind of combination we want to assess. And, but then too, uh, regardless of uh, which theory is going to be deployed, we have to listen to people. I think one further development of this debate more recently is, the, is that we realize uh, People have very, very different perceptions of human augmentation in different countries. This has been made very clear by the Siena project, I, I, a project I had the opportunity to, to take part in. It was funded by the EU. But then, too, uh, last year, the Kaspersky uh, published a report uh, which also made it clear that uh, different countries, uh, people in different accounts can have very, very different perception about cognitive enhancement or enhancement by means of CRISPR, for example, it's a big topic to, it, should, it must be regulated, of course. But then too, uh, these perceptions can change geographically, but a further topic I have been interested, to, uh, interested in uh, for some time now is the realization that um, perception can also change in time. There has been a lot of discussion about human enhancement, but there has not been much discussion about the history of, uh, of human enhancement. We think of enhancement as something that's either happening now or it's going to happen in the future, but as a matter of fact, even though the word uh, or the expression human enhancement has not been used in the past, there was a discussion about human enhancement um, 
after the First World War, enhancement by means of prosthetic limbs. It was a huge debate in Germany, particularly um, governments thought they might make uh, former soldiers more productive by producing high-tech um, uh, kind, new kinds of prosthetic limbs. Even from our perspective today, it's, it looks impressive, the prosthetic limbs that they have been produced at the time. And after the Second World War, there was a change of um, cognitive enhancement by means of amphetamines. And I'm more particularly interested now with my colleague, Professor Vilasa, in, in, in exploring the hitherto uh, history, uh, or unexplored uh, history of human enhancement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just pretty much described the plot line of uh, the Bionic Man uh, movies as well in that too. So uh, it, we, it's great to, to know that Eva is now with us. We're going to come to you in a moment, Eva. But um, before I do, Marco, um, what is, do you think is the main role of private businesses in the technical community in this discussion? Well, uh, I think Tristan already made it uh, quite clear, and uh, it's a very nice example, to be honest. Uh, working with high standards towards the society, um, but also, of course, not to exclude it, uh, also towards economy, having sustainability and so on. Um, I think these new questions not having the main focus just about money whatsoever but educating the society bringing up the discussions explaining the bit uh, the pitfalls um, and also working with higher values higher standards that's that goes along especially with this technology what do we have today and what steps can, should we uh, should be undertaken on this level in the next five to ten years, do you think? I think exactly these points we have to develop further, this accessibility we have and the enablement, um, responsibilities and rights is a huge term and that's exactly also again a topic where this regulation policies come in. I mean, we made this example with the uh, cybersecurity policy we created for um, augmented employees or parties, third parties uh, working for us or working with us. And this is like a first step. This is an example. This is the way we have to go over the next years to ensure that we have all of these topics covered in the right way. Mm. Not only, as I said before, not limiting, not making it more stricter, but shaping it and enable this accessibility um, to avoid the problems, the potential problems we may have in terms of inequality or other problems which uh, may divide society, for example, bring up a lot of problems also from the criminal sector again, like everything what we're doing on a social level will have a huge impact also further on, on the technological level in terms of how attacks maybe go on. A uh, simple example, if I just have a few more seconds uh, to, to, to make this a bit more clear. Um, so having, for example, technologies which are like uh, just cheap and uh, you can get it everywhere, but we have to pay with it, with our privacy, with our data, with our personal life, is maybe the wrong way, but on the other uh, hand, we have this huge risk, which also was shown in our survey, um, that what if only wealthy people will have access to certain technologies, so we have this split in a technology, this may go on into like different criminal activities, like trying to steal, like theft, all of that kind of stuff, ransom, and so on. So we also have to think about this like from the full angle, from the full scale. It's not just one topic. We have to address this whole topic in order to ensure security and, and protection at all levels. I'm glad you mentioned the you know, potential for another digital divide. And the other area that concerns me is obviously protecting the vulnerable. Um, you know, we think about um, in, in Japan at the moment, they are actually using exoskeletons to help elderly people keep working in heavy lifting environments longer. Well, 
you know what if they don't want to keep working in heavy lifting environments longer and you then are in a position where you're pressured um, by your your work to um, to use this equipment. These are all the kinds of questions that I that I want us to be thinking about. Um, now it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Member of European Parliament for Greece, Eva Kelly, uh, joining us uh, hot off of another IGF session. So Eva, thank you for joining us. Um, as well as being an MEP, you are Chairman of the European Parliament Committee on the Future of Technology and Science. So you really do bring a unique perspective to this discussion. Um, could you give us a brief Brief opening statement outlining your sort of what you believe are the key issues um, uh, in this issue and how you would see them tackled. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And it's a very timely and very, very interesting event. So thank you for inviting me. I'm always participating also to the IGF, IGF so I'm uh, happy to be with the technologies. I think here is not something different than what we've been discussing about how in the translation to the digital economy and era we need to make sure we will ensure that our principles and fundamental values will be respected by the use of these technologies they present different challenges and they can actually present extreme challenges so with a great uh, uh, innovation comes also great responsibility since you can um, actually uh, bring a lot of benefits in the health sector, uh, but at the same time, we understand that uh, we can give rise to more biohacking. And uh, we also uh, are during this pandemic uh, realizing that the technologies could be solutions, but they could also bring, you know, the, the challenges that will go beyond borders and we need to join forces to achieve um, our resilience and defense um, to, this, uh, um, to these threats. So um, as more companies will start producing, of course, tools, we will be able to understand the extent of these risks and the extent of the fears. And we will be able to adapt our current legislative initiatives to ensure by law that people can trust these technologies and they can take place in a safe way without compromising privacy, fundamental rights or principles. So we need to have the benefits of these technologies. We need to ensure that um, we will understand how the use of it could um, uh, could not have, you know, could not at least deliberately harm uh, people or society. And we need, of course, to have constantly assessments on uh, these uh, these technologies and how they, they affect us. I, I will just give one example that, for example, it's really raising concerns uh, to us. And I think it's gonna be the maybe perhaps even the fifth industrial revolution. It's gonna be biotechnology. Neuralink of Elon Musk uh, is currently advancing the development of implantable brain machine interfaces to treat serious brain diseases in the short term um, with the eventual goal of human enhancement. And with whatever this means in terms of like presenting challenges, risks and concerns to citizens because these technologies, they are made by humans and we understand also that they are not perfect. Um, so we, we, we might love uh, to have a possibility to increase our memory capacity or to learn languages super fast. But then this goes vice versa. We could be influenced, manipulated and controlled by external sources and by external um, uh, uh, potential threats. Um, so it's really important to develop the specific policies for the use and, and to make sure that people will have affordable uh, affordable access to these technologies and immediately they will feel that they're safe to use those technologies. So um, since uh, we talk about, again, um, uh, people in the loop and having control of their data and of this uh, uh, technology, we are developing constantly ethical frameworks works for all these technologies. Now it's AI, it's on the table, but it's the convergence with other technologies that lead us to the um, topic of the discussion today. And um, sometimes we are saying that it's better to be late, not to prevent innovation, because innovation is out of the box thinking. But in this regards, I think we need to have appropriate safeguards. So even discussing something that looks like science fiction, but already we have the potential to use these technologies today, uh, I think it really should ring bells for, to us to uh, move much uh, faster. And um, we should not just allow the self-regulation uh, approach. I think we should do more. And that's why 
um, Europe, European politicians and like-minded international partners, we are collaborating to agree on, on common standards, um, uh, minimum standards at least that would respect the, all what I mentioned, principle-based, and to set our red lines and strict obligations. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Um, we've heard a range of opinions in terms of the um, level of uh, interaction that the government should have, uh, you know, in regulation. Uh, you know, there is the argument about stifling innovation. Um, but for me, one of the really important issues um, is I inclusion. Uh, and I know that um, ever that, you know, sort of digital inclusion and, and respect for human rights is very high on, on your um, agenda. How much do you think the government and what are the responsibilities of governments and civil society in regards to laying out a roadmap to digital inclusion um, in this area? Well, it uh, depends. We, when we discuss in Europe about inclusion, it means we should avoid exclusion in access to services, in benefits, and we talk about, you know, uh, I think, uh, not harmful exclusion, but when you talk in a global uh, scale about what exclusion could mean, then you look at China and you see that you could be excluded by uh, uh, by the basic income, by the main services to have the freedom, you know, to um, of movement and privacy and and uh, uh, everything that we consider, you know, we take for granted in Europe. So um, I know that it, uh, it, it might sound difficult, you know, to define, but again, I think the best response to your answer, is, to your question is my, my answer would be, uh, we need to have a principle-based approach. We need to find a methodology to ensure that high-risk applications and technologies will follow stricter obligations and rules. This cannot cause more friction, I agree, but when we talk about harmful, we mean also larger, bigger with bigger extent and specific sectors. Um, and everybody thought that GDPR could like stifle innovation, but it didn't. Actually, we have more unicorns now in Europe, more legal certainty, and Europe is a huge market. And these technologies, again, since they are cross-border, I hope and I feel that this is the role of Europe to play, uh, ethical framework and quality of life uh, having these technologies to be complementary to what humans do already. And of course, to have publicly uh, accessible uh, human rights as impact assessments for all the uses of these exponential technologies should be carried out and should be available to, to everyone uh, to, to be able to update our safeguards. Marcelo, is there anything in your sort of experience uh, academically and research that, that you can bring to the table in terms of what would be a good balance to um, you know ensure inclusion but also ensure that you're not stifling innovation with too much regulation yeah this is the real challenge uh, how to to benefit from new technologies um without uh, stifling it as you say i think one special challenge here is uh, how to uh, regulate across borders. If we see, as I have uh, mentioned, uh, that different countries have very different perceptions of human augmentation, chances there are that if you regulate some new technology very, very strictly in, on, in one country, the high middle class in that country will cross the border in order to have that kind of service somewhere else. Uh, uh, this is already the case as regards, for example, Genetic, genetic technologies. Uh, maybe it's uh, prohibited in some country. It, it all, all, already happens, for example, as with um, abortion. But when it happens, when it uh, happens with um, genetic engineering or embryo selection, you can have a country where it's very, very strictly uh, regulated, but it will not prevent it rich people from from other countries from going there and have their service for for this is a reason there has to be some kind of international agreement as to how to deal with this case um, but mm. this is of course a, a huge challenge yeah a challenge for every industry in fact uh, tristan your exoskeletons you know clearly from your video um huge sort of life enhancer for people who've lost their the use of their their limbs to some extent. Um, how would you like to see 
inclusion regulated within this industry to make sure that technology like that is available to people who perhaps can't afford to go to a mountain for a spot of skiing. <laughs> Well, first, the, uh, the mountain example is more like is more an example to showcase um, how far the technology can go. It's really not the way that we envisioned our product will be used uh, daily. We really care about reducing the impact of secondary health issues on daily living of people, and that means you know bowel function, bladder function. These are essential parts of our daily routine and our daily life that we need to all access to. I think it's fundamental rights to have the uh, capacity to control your bowel and your bladder and to not have your bones brittle and break as soon as you just sit for five minutes on a chair. And I think uh, technology like, like the one we're developing is helping reducing inequalities in this way that we're helping people reduce the impact and the burden of disability on their daily life. Um, and I think access to healthcare has made possible through innovation in terms of business innovation. I mean, insurances, health insurances, were innovation that were not technical, that were um, you know, institutional innovations. And I think this is the kind of innovation uh, that we need to uh, think for, to look for and foster. And, and I think it's the same in terms of also preventing risks. If we can make sure that the business models that are governing uh, the major companies that are providing services, I'm, I'm talking about Facebook, for instance, it's the business model of Facebook, which is harming people and incentivizing the, the, the company into uh, harnessing the data and the private information of people and selling the data to third parties. This is the business model that is harmful. And I think we have to innovate not just in technology, but also in the business model approaches. And I think there is a great deal of new ways of thinking how to provide technology to people and how to finance it in a way that makes inequalities bearable for, for society. Well, we have three minutes left. Time really does fly, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, Marta, your question is actually a little bit off topic. Topic. So I'm going to get Marco Ploys to answer you uh, privately on that. Um, let us finish, because we haven't had any other interactions from the floor, but let us finish just very briefly. I would like to ask each of you um, to make a closing statement just in you know, a few words. Um, how can we make use of digital technologies to promote more equitable and peaceful societies that are inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. Um, uh, Wojtek, what, what for you, in, in one sentence, what, what are the most important issues around this? I believe in our case, I'm, I'm saying it from Walkmore's perspective, it's to also encourage companies and state organization, whatever it's an institution from the government or any agency, or even the European Parliament, to digitalize as much as possible, because I believe that tokenization and digitalizations are the way forward in terms of uh, cybersecurity and in terms of the identity, because that's something that cannot be lost if properly uh, captured and protected over the Perfect. internet. Through, uh, bandwidth. Great, I'm gonna stop you there. Uh, Jorge, um, do you have a, a closing thought? Of a few few words. Yeah, from Chile Robotics Lab SEL, we work under the sustainable development objectives of the United Nations and uh, developing technologies that meet the needs of the present without compromising the capacity of future generations. We think of STEM, science, technology, engineering, nature, art, and, and maths, and uh, living nature and the human being as a transversal axis, safely working for a cyber immunity together with Kaspersky. Ilya, same to you. Yeah, I think uh, the main goal is that such technology has to be available uh, to everyone. It's, I think, the, the primary uh, issue to make more peaceful society in future, uh, more peaceful augment, augment, augmented society. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Tristan? Yeah, to close, I'd like to um, see more people involved across the board uh, of all stakeholders. If we're all going to step into the future that is going to be radically different from now. I'd love to see artists, uh, policymakers step into that future before technologies for once. And, and I really highly encourage um, people from across the board to, uh, to build that future together instead of only uh, technologies first. Great advice. Marcelo. Um, I do believe in the power of new technologies to promote dialogue and mutual understanding across borders. 
And I think we're going to, to, to need a lot of this to face new challenges we're going to have in the near future as we've got new pandemics and climate change. And I think it's a force for the good, new technologies. Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, Marco. I think the future can only be shaped by all of us together, also in terms of technologies, but not excluding technologies, but more including technologies, because it's clear from today that technologies are essential for our future. Brilliant. And Eva, final last few words to you. We're in our, we're in overtime right now. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Um, okay, uh, I guess um, as we are now at 5.30, Eva's probably rushed off to another meeting, I, I shouldn't wonder. Um, that is unfortunately all we have time for. Many thanks to our stakeholders for sharing their time and expertise and to Kaspersky for hosting the session. And thank you for being here and listening. I hope that it gave you some food for thought. Um, let's keep talking about it. I think we can all agree that the possibilities for human augmentation are incredibly exciting, but we have to remain vigilant about especially cybersecurity and the ethical risks around embedding technology into our actual bodies. We need to continue to address the increasing need for global cybersecurity regulation, for human augmentation in conversations just like this. Enjoy the rest of your sessions here at the IGF. Thank you so much for attending and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.